Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ahmed. I'm a medical student at Al Faisal University. And I'm part of this wonderful initiative by uh, Al Faisal colleagues and I called Al Faisal Whiteboard. And what we're trying to do in Al Faisal Whiteboard is that we're trying to uh, bring together the most difficult basic science courses that our medical students have difficulty with and introduce sort of this peer-to-peer -peer learning style which students can benefit from, from uh, in regards to their uh, you know, university exams or even in regards to their board exams such as uh, the USMLE. So before I begin talking about our topic today, I just want to tell you and I understand how many students absolutely are disgusted from biochemistry and they hate it, they hate it to death. Um, and I am, I'm going to tell you right here, when I was a first year medical student, I had the same exact feelings. Um, I hated biochemistry. It was the worst topic. It was the worst course for me. Um, I complained about it all the time to my peers. In fact, my grades were worst when it came to biochemistry. Um, I know this is probably not exactly the best introduction you wanted. Oh, this guy is getting bad grades in biochemistry. He's going to teach us. But just try to trust me along um, uh, in this process because, you know, I've really grown to love biochemistry actually uh, in the, you know, beginning of the third and fourth years of medical school, medical school when I really realized how important biochemistry is in correlating with and you know connecting with other basic sciences such as physiology and pathology as well as your uh, um, your clinical uh, aspects. So I'm what I'm trying to do over here is I'm trying to make biochemistry as lovable as possible, uh, and I'm trying to make biochemistry as clinically correlated as possible. Because you know you guys are medical students, you're going to become doctors, you're going to become physicians, clinicians. You guys are going to be dealing with sick patients. That's counterintuitive as a medical student. But, you know, we're going to try to make it as clinically relevant as possible. So let's get started. Bismillah. So biochemistry, biochemistry is made up of reactions, right? That's basically what it is. You know, I know we talk about, you know, all these pathways and, oh my God, aldolase B and pyruvate kinase and I have no idea where I am and I'm really lost in these pathways, but let's just delve into the basics. It's made up of reactions, right? And when we talk about a reaction, it's basically made up of two things. It's made up of a substrate being converted to a product, all right? It's made up of substrate being converted to a product, S to P, right? So in the conversion of a substrate to a product, there are two important aspects that we need to talk about. The first aspect that we need to talk about is what we refer to as thermodynamics. Let's put this in red right here. Thermodynamics of a reaction. And the other aspect that we need to talk about are the kinetics of a reaction. Now let's talk about each of these individually. The thermodynamics of a reaction, they answer a question. And the question they answer is, is in the conversion of S to P, will S be converted to P? I mean, that's the first thing. If you want a reaction, if you want a reaction, a reaction needs to happen, right? I mean, that's the first thing you ask yourself. Will S be converted to P? And the answer to this is, what is the energy that is required in order to convert S to P? What is the energy required to complete a reaction? That's what thermodynamics talks about. Now, what kinetics talk about are, they talk about the rate of a reaction or the velocity of the reaction. How fast will this reaction happen? So they talk about how fast the reaction will happen, not about whether the reaction will happen or not. The reaction better happen. So if it is happening, 
we need to understand how fast it's going to happen. So the energy required to form a reaction is what we call the delta G, or what we call the Gibbs free energy. All right, that's why it's called G. Delta G refers to the Gibbs free energy. And the, the rate and the velocity of a reaction is actually governed by what? You know, in, in biochemistry, you always see what? You always see S convert to P, but there's always that annoying enzyme in the middle right here. And it's just so annoying because you got to memorize its name. What on earth do these enzymes do? Well, what these enzymes do, and we're going to talk about that a little in more complexity, the enzymes, they govern the rate and the velocity of the reaction. Enzymes make, make your reactions go faster. Instead of S being converted to P in 100 hours, enzymes make S be, get converted to P in two hours, for example. All right? Now, I'm sure you're thinking right now, he put delta G. I mean, you know, I remember in physics and chemistry in high school, anything with a delta means that there's a differential, right? So there has to be some sort of equation over here, right? And you're absolutely correct. The delta G is equivalent to the energy of the product, or we could say GP, minus the energy of the substrate. We can call it GS. This is a very, very important equation, all right? I actually want you to remember this equation. Okay, delta G, or the energy that is required for a reaction, is equal to the energy of the product minus the energy of the substrate. Now, what we're going to be talking about first is we're going to talk about the thermodynamics of a reaction. Now you understood the basics of a reaction, let's talk about the thermodynamics of a reaction. So let's go ahead and put this equation. Now you might be thinking, in math, it's very important to know that 4 minus 2 equals 2, right? That value, that number 2 is so important to us, right? Well, over here, we're not really too concerned about the numerical value. We do not care about the number. What we do care about is, in fact, the sign. Is this going to yield a positive? Is the energy of the reaction positive? Is it negative? Is it zero? That's what we're concerned about. So let's take that one by one. Let's go ahead and take that, take the possibilities one by one. So let's say that the delta G is less than zero. If the delta G is less than zero, that means it's negative. Now think about it. What is the delta G? It is the energy required to a complete a reaction. Hmm. The energy required to complete a reaction is negative. What does that mean? That means that you're actually not really requiring energy. You're actually releasing energy in the reaction. That's how easy the reaction is. The reaction is so easy. It's so cool. It's just going to, it's not even requiring energy. It's releasing energy. So basically, when the delta G is less than zero, that means that the energy of the substrate is greater than the energy of the product. Now, let's just be a little bit intuitive over here. What do you, I mean, substrate to product. If the energy of the substrate is greater than the energy of the product, this is going to be an easy forward reaction. It's going to be a downhill reaction. It's going to be a reaction that happens, what, spontaneously. Ah, now here's a little bit of terminology that board examiners like to confuse you with. What they like to say is, well, instead of putting spontaneous, why don't we just tell them it's instantaneous? But that doesn't mean the same thing. Spontaneous means that the reaction will happen. But it doesn't mean it's going to happen right now. Instantaneous means it's going to happen right now, which means we're talking about the rate of the reaction. We're talking about the velocity of the reaction. And what governs the rate and the velocity of the reaction? Exactly, kinetics. And what governs that? Exactly, enzymes. Excellent. 
go ahead and get yourself a cookie. Now, what I like to give an example of, let's use a nice color over here. Let's say you got a hill. All right. Wonderful. Looks like a bell shaped curve, too. So you got a hill right here. And let's say you got a ball like right here. It's just standing right there. Now, let me ask you a question. How much energy do you need for, let's say, a guy right here to just go ahead and kick that ball? It doesn't need anything. Just a little nudge and it's going down, right? So you don't really need to consume too much energy in order for this reaction to happen, right? So this, ener this, this is sort of an energy-releasing reaction. And since, an, since it's an energy-releasing reaction, we call it an exergonic reaction. We call it an exergonic reaction. All right? These two terminologies, these two term terms are very important. A spontaneous exergonic reaction means that the delta G, delta G is less than zero. Exergonic means that the energy that's being released is greater than the energy that's being, what, consumed. After all, this is a differential, all right? The energy that's being released is greater than the energy that's being consumed. This is what we refer to as a spontaneous exergonic reaction. Let me give you another example for this. Let's say you got a cell membrane. This is the intracellular environment. This is the extracellular environment. And let's take the wonderful cation sodium. Let's say you got three sodiums outside and one sodium inside. You're with the concentration gradient, right? You're going with the concentration gradient. These sodiums will enter through the cell membrane easily, right? They can enter either through diffusion, facilitated diffusion. I mean, this is physiology. I'm just giving you a, a, an example of how our body works, all right? So it's the same thing. Now, let's ask ourselves the question. What if the delta G is greater than zero? What if the delta G is greater than zero? Well, that means that the energy of the substrate is less than the energy of the product. Well, this means if you put that S and P, that S is going to be small, that P is going to be huge, David versus Goliath. So basically, you can see right here that this is going to be an uphill reaction. It's going to be so difficult, right? That means this reaction right here, and let's take the analogy. Let's take the analogy perfectly, all right? Let's go ahead and draw that hill. And let's say the ball's right here. Now, let me ask you a question. This ball right here is more likely to fall on its own than this ball right here, right? This ball right here is more likely to fall than this ball right here. I mean, this ball is, is impossible. How on earth is a ball going to go up the hill and down the hill on its own? So technically, this is a non-spontaneous reaction. What does that mean? That means the reaction will not happen, right? Reaction will not happen. Unless what? Unless I get someone right here to go ahead and really, really push. He doesn't give a nudge. He really needs to push that ball up and down the hill. So basically, this is an, a reaction that requires energy that consumes more energy than it releases. And that's why we call it an endergonic reaction. Remember, exer means what? From exo, which means outside, means it's releasing energy, correct? This is an endergonic reaction. So basically, the energy being consumed is greater than the energy being released. You need so much energy to get that ball up right? Now think about it. If this reaction will not happen unless there is energy, then what does that mean? That means that it needs energy from another reaction. I mean, where on earth are you going to get energy from? Well, if you think about it right now, you 
intuitively. And any endergonic reaction requires an exergonic reaction that is releasing energy. If, if an endergonic reaction is not going to happen unless there's energy, then we need an exergonic reaction associated with it that will release energy and that energy can be used by the non-spontaneous endergonic reaction in order for that reaction to happen. Here's the equivalent for the cell membrane. Let's say you got a cell membrane right here. Again, intracellular environment, extracellular environment. Let's, for example, now take the cation potassium. We all know potassium is rich intracellularly, right? Now it's against the concentration gradient. Potassium is not going to diffuse inside, right? Never, ever. It's not going to diffuse unless you got some special thing over here that's present in all cells, right? You got this special thing right here called a what? A sodium potassium pump. I'm just giving an analogy over here. This is your physiology, but I'm giving an analogy. A sodium potassium pump that will bring potassium inside and pump sodium outside. And we call it a sodium potassium what? ATPase, meaning that it's utilizing energy in order for this potassium to enter. Any uphill battle requires more energy. All right. Now, there's another possibility. Now that you've understood the delta G minus zero and the delta G uh, greater than zero, what if the delta G is equal to zero? I mean, what does that mean? If the delta G is equal to zero, this means this is a reversible reaction. All right, this is, an, this is a reversible reaction. So basically, if you have substrate to product, I mean, product can become substrate, all right? Or you can say A to B, B to A, all right? These are the essences of the Gibbs free energy.